So uh, I'm very anxious for us to get started, uh, in part because I'm looking forward to the papers on this panel. So let me uh, welcome everyone early on a Friday morning to uh, the first panel in the conference, Africa, Globalization, and the Muslim World. It's a practice in uh, theater and drama in South Asia that I'm familiar with, that the director or someone in a position like me comes up first and first says, oh, we have a really exciting thing to look forward to. We have some ex an excellent uh, cast of people, and that's what we have of all the people here on the panel. We have an excellent audience uh, to, uh, be, that is capable of appreciating what is going to be presented. And we have a, ex some excellent scripts of these different papers that we're going to be able to listen to. The format uh, uh, we, we will pr uh, follow is that we'll have questions after each paper presentation. And so the speakers will end with enough time for us to ask uh, a few questions. And then uh, we may cut it into the break a little bit to allow the excellence of the papers to have all the time that they need. So let me first introduce uh, the first speaker, Diego Giovanni Casalianos, who is from the National University of Colombia. And will speak about Muslim identity and social marginality among uh, an African descendant Colombian community. If you want to sit here. Uh, good morning. Uh, well, uh, this presentation is um, in relation with um, research we made some years ago, about seven years ago, um, of a specific Muslim community in Western Colombia. Colombia, um, is similar to other places in Latin America, uh, we don't have a strong Muslim presence, uh, of course, a part of Brazil and probably in Argentina. A country like, like Colombia, uh, Muslim communities are very few, and in fact, uh, they are very new communities. But most of the times, the communities, for example, in Bogota or in, in northern Colombia, are from um, migration origins, especially from people from Palestine and Lebanon, and in the last 20 years, by conversion uh, of mestizo, mestizo people. In, of different cities of Colombia. But this case is different. This is the case of uh, an Afro-descendant community. Uh, they became Muslims in about 50, 55 years ago. And uh, it's interesting because first, it was the first organized and recognized Muslim community in Colombia. But at the same time, they uh, were situated in a um, very low on the loop region in our country. And because of that, they are not visible. Most of the time the people speak about Islam in Colombia or about Muslims in Colombia, usually they don't think about this group. First, because they are Af African descendants and of course exist a lot of racism and um, marginality in this population in, in Colombia. Secondly, because um, they are Shia. They became Shia Muslims in the early in the 90s, and because of that, um, that became another reason for them to be a part of uh, most of the other communities. Um, well, I'm going to try to advance in the task. I think that is probably a bit longer, so I'm going to focus in just some parts that I think is, are important, especially because uh, what I found is that exists a close connection between ethnic identity and uh, the conversion, the process of conversion to Islam. And at the same time, uh, the, the black identity uh, is the center of the, their effort to maintain as Muslims, no matter all the problems they have during all these years, but at the same time is the main focus from which they uh, can in, made interpretations of the Islamic traditions, but at the same time of the local Afro-descendant and Catholic traditions that is the heritage they have until today. Well, um, the Muslim community of Buenaventura can be described as a group of Afro-Colombians that for over half a century has used Islam as a way to find and, def 
and to find and define a place in society. The community is composed of at least 600 individuals. Uh, please take present that in Colombia, the Muslim population is about 10,000 Muslims. It's a very small Muslim population, but it's very representative. Usually they, they, they have a strong representation in the media and in the debates about the uh, religious diversity rights in our country, especially in the last 10 years. Um, most of them are situated in Buenaventura. Buenaventura is this city that we can see here in Western Colombia. It's a port, a very important port in Colombia, uh, in the Pacific region, in the Valle del Cauca. The main city uh, of this department is uh, Cali, and Buenaventura is some kind of a uh, satellite uh, city uh, of Cali. Uh, so most of the people of this people are situated in Buenaventura, but with time, some Muslims migrated to Cali because there exist more opportunities for jobs and for education there. Well, what happened with this group is that it emerged in the late 60s, uh, when this small group of young Afro-Colombian leaders became interested in the ideas of the Nation of Islam. This group was successful in establishing a modest organization in the 70s and was the basis of what became later the first legally recognized Muslim community in Colombia. Well, I think it's important to take in account that uh, Afro-Colombian is defined, at least by Luis Castillo, as the descendants of black Africans who were brought to, as slaves to New Granada, currently Colombia, uh, during the Spanish colonial period. Um, as this population came from different regions and societies in Africa, the question arises if the mere fact as one's ancestors coming from that continent is a sufficient condition to consider one a member of a single ethnic group. And I think it's a discussion that is still is important in Colombia because uh, we have this idea about black people. And because of that, we consider that all Afro-descendants are the same kind of people and with some kind of um, common uh, traditions. And, and of course, it's not so simple. Um, according to Luis Castillo too, the, the four basic elements to consider one person as Afro-Colombian or one group is ethnicity, of course, and exists four points. First, a myth of origin, Africa, a special relation with nature and a deep identification with their territory, in this case, the Colombian Pacific Coast, a shared history marked by three events, the African past, slavery, and the struggle for freedom, and a common culture in music, some religious practices and beliefs, and a distinctive approach to death. Uh, for the purposes of studying the, this Muslim community, I divide the history of the group in four periods. Uh, the division was made especially taking in account the changes, the changes in their uh, religious discourse and practices uh, that happened during, the, during those decades. The first phase, uh, which runs from 1960s to 1980s, cover the origins of the community and is the moment of consolidation under the influence of the American religious movement Nation of Islam. At this time, there were more individuals of the affiliation. And we don't have a, families in this period, and families and real Muslim <coughs> families start to emerge with time. But of course, in this time was more the, the search of some individuals trying to, to find a place and a discourse to, to locate themselves uh, in this moment of rapid changes in, in Colombia, and those were the times when most of the rural areas experimented <coughs> violence um, because of poverty. Most, a lot of people uh, traveled to the cities, finding for new opportunities, but because of that, uh, we have some kind of um, loss of sense of uh, this connection with the reality, especially because the traditional skin, um, the traditional king relations um, does not work anymore, at least not in the same way than before when they were in the territory near the rivers. 
uh, they need to find <laughs> another kind of identity. Um, the, because of the education, the improvement in the education of these communities, they started to realize the situation of marginalization and discrimination they have in Colombia. And because of that, this is the moment when the black movement start uh, to emerge in Colombia, but uh, to fight for the improvement of this population. The second stage runs from 1991 to 1991, and is defined by the beginning of a crisis within the group, which was made up of individuals and some Muslim families. The crisis was caused by, in part by external difficulties related to the loss of doctrinal references. Local problems also began to arise due to changes within the Afro-Colombian population, and lastly, internal tensions with emerged uh, because of this debate about universal Islamic values and local interpretation uh, about what does uh, mean to be a Muslim. Um, we have another moment from 1991 to 2002 that was characterized by the adoption of Shiite Islam. Um, this proximity to Iran emerged because of the opportunities that Iran uh, offered to these people, especially in relation with religious education and travel first to Argentina and then to come in Iran. Um, this is the moment when the current leaders of the community uh, emerge. Um, um, this was the first moment where this, the community really uh, approached to traditional Islam. Both initially, both to Sunni Islam, but with time to Shia Islam too, but to traditional Islam. Because until that, the influence of nation is of Islam and the lack in materials and of leaders with real knowledge about Muslim tradition was a problem for, the, for them. And they tried to, to fulfill, fulfill these gaps with the, the elements they have at hand. Uh, first, the Afro uh, Colombian uh, traditions, but second, uh, the Catholic tradition. Well, um, despite the importance, um, let me have that no. When addressing the description and analysis of the beliefs and practices upon which the religious life of Muslims in Buenaventura is constructed, it is necessary to differentiate those aspects according to the different stages that have marked the community since its inception in the mid-60s. Um, while from the beginning, Buenaventura Muslims have had political and social concerns, namely the struggle for equality of Afro-Colombians, religion soon became the main reason for organization, the main focus of their collective actions and an important basis from which to define their identity. For this reason, any adaptation was considered an enrichment, and the religion changes of the past are evaluated as acquired knowledge. They are very proud of all this process of experimentation with uh, different kinds of Muslim traditions. Hmm. It would be naive, however, to pretend that the traditional African worldview disappear altogether. Uh, rather, we can find expressions of it in the places where Islam is practiced and transmitted. This syncretism is evident as narrated by members of the community, and it is significant that although in some narratives supernatural forces that attack them are identified as genies, the solution to this problem is found is found not usually in the Quran or in Salat or some kind of Muslim practices, but in practices more related with Santeria or traditional sorcery. In the accounts of healing rituals, a, commun a combination of elements of popular Christianity and African Santeria appear, while usually not Islamic concepts are mentioned. And I think it's interesting because they are very aware that they are Muslims, but they think they can work uh, to complement their traditional religious and social life with all these other elements. They don't want until now to, to make a, a real break with this past. In Buenaventura, even the per if the person is Muslim, 
the people believe that the real protection comes from tradition. For that reason, in each family, there is a member that performs rituals and prayers of protection. When that person dies, if it happens, the young members are left unprotected. When asked for an explanation about this kind of experiences, members of the community as expected lack the cultural heritage of traditional Muslim societies, so often resort to popular Christian tradition to fill, to fill these gaps. In, it is thus noteworthy that some Muslims affected by witchcraft do not try to stay away from African traditions and limit themselves to Islamic practices in seeking a solution. They attend the mosque and even try some forms of healing with the shaykh, but without being able to stop the problem. Surely, such healing by sorcery is rejected, but some Muslims, although they are tolerant to some Catholic religious practices, of course, exist religious of, um, of healing in relation with Catholic um, tradition is not just the religious discourse of Catholicism. We, they are uh, aware that there exists difference uh, between the Muslim and the Catholic tradition, but the practices, the practices are important for them. When we think about this community as a black community, um, we can say that um, the idea of Africa uh, permits the reinforcing of values considered beneficial for the group against a mestizo and Christian social environment in which African culture is undervaluated, the community members claim and idealize the richness of African culture. As stated above, Africa serves as an ideal. For that reason, there is often a request by the sheikh for community members motivating them to behave in certain ways. Although the reference to Muslim doctrine is such as such is the most recurrent incentive for the community, the allusion to alleged African values is also common. For example, Sheikh Munir says, it makes us very sorry to say that African brothers, today we are not meeting our traditions or an identity. As a black community, Muslims appeal to the, black, to the African ideal as a way of supporting the effort for maintaining a neutral position in facing the violence of Colombian armed conflict. In that sense, sermons, sermons are not simply aimed at the strengthening attitudes or specific loyalties, but also seeking to keep Muslims away from problems in Buenaventura to the extent possible. And I think this is important, especially because the social situation, especially, especially for young people in, in Buenaventura, is very difficult. Yeah, the existence of the traffic of drugs, uh, paramilitarians, the armed conflict in general for them is, is a risk for the Muslim families. And because of that, these ideas about the, some idealized African values that they need to reinforce, uh, permit them, uh, uh, it's an effort to try to take their young people away of those kind of problems. Uh, another aspect that affects Afro-Colombian population, of course, is the idea of whitening. This is a process by which racist cultural background decreases traditions and physical characteristics of Afro-Colombians by preventing upward mobility or through marriage with people of lighter skin. While these ideas are common among Afro-Colombians from different socioeconomic levels, uh, it's clear that uh, members of the Muslim community uh, have an active opposition to such ideas. Well, I'm, because I don't have too much time, I'm going to focus in uh, part of the conclusions. Um, then, in Buenaventura, Muslim was initially an ethnicity rather than a religious category. Later, when social demands lost their centrality to the group, religion was placed as an epicenter of the discourse and group boundaries were extended to the potential consideration of other types of ethnic identity. It is important, therefore, to note that members of the modeling community of Buenaventura are part of invisible minorities, 
both in terms of their ethnicity and in terms of their religiosity. In that sense, there is not a context of normality within which Muslim practices could be naturalized and people forget their uniqueness. On, on the contrary, the social context is a permanent reminder of their religious difference, and therefore to remain Muslim is a task of constant reaffirmation. At the same time, the existence of some, some form of black identity does not necessarily imply that ethnicity constitutes the most important social reference or the main in, engine for mobilization. However, combined, black and Muslim identities are not mere reference of identification, but gateway to mobilization strategies. This phenomenon occurs in two ways. One, on one side, the community started practices of reinterpretation of traditional myths and rituals according to new frames of reference, but also developed civic agendas within the group in pursuit of common political and economic benefits, which led the members of the community to become agents of change, impacting the, impacting the environment in which Muslims operate. Uh, to finish, the history of Afro-Colombian Muslims is not just about a minority or an exotic phenomenon in a predominantly Catholic country. On the contrary, the phenomena studied here are the result of the historical processes of Colombian society. For this reason, this community should be studied further as a reflection of the problems and changes of the local population in a globalized world and not as some kind of isolated implantation of Islam, thinking in Islam as some kind of Middle East implantation in a distant port of Latin America. Thank you. So we have time for questions. You made a comment that a lot of the Muslims converted to Shi'i Islam, and I was wondering if you could say more about that. Uh, yes, I, I couldn't listen well the last part, uh, the conversion to Shi'ism. Yeah, you made a comment about uh, many of the Muslims becoming Shia. Yeah, 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 they became Shia. Well, yes, uh, what happened is that um, Shi'ism in Colombia, in, uh, it's interesting because most of the people that converted to Chism in Colombia, at least, usually they have this background of social fights, uh, usually in, in leftist groups, but uh, in social rights groups too. Uh, I think it's a way to, uh, how could I say, to, to, um, to advance in this uh, idea that um, leftist groups are lack of religion. And because of that, they have this combination of religious uh, beliefs and uh, social fights. Uh, because of that existed in, in all Colombian history, uh, this connection between uh, religious and social fights. But in the case of this group, I think because they have this previous um, rupture, this, they broke with the, officially with the Catholic traditions, uh, they need to find new um, points of reference in Islamic tradition. And at the same time, because uh, Iran, uh, they opened an embassy in, in Bogota, they started a, a project, uh, well, different activities for Dawa, um, for trying to develop groups in which they could have some influence, and they support the formation of leaders in, in, in Iran. And because of that, they can, that connection began. But I think it's interesting, interesting that the group think that uh, that connection uh, implies to put a limit in the influence of the Iranian interest for the community. Uh, in fact, when you go to the places, uh, the institutional places of, of the community, you can see uh, the picture of uh, Ayatollahs, uh, Khomeini especially, or Khamenei or some other. But uh, uh, in the other side, you can see the picture of Mal Malcolm X. Uh, 
And sometimes when the people from the Iranian embassy go, they just take out the, the picture of Malcolm X. And when they go, they put the picture of Malcolm X again. And I think it's more important, in fact, Malcolm X, because in fact, in the, in the school and in the mosque, they celebrate the birth of, of Malcolm and they, the student make some speeches and things like that. I think they are aware that they need to find how to introduce these ideas of schism in a very different social context, context in which they, they live, um, especially because they don't want to let apart their traditions that are important for them. Are there any confrontation between uh, Sunni and Shia Muslims, uh, controversies, etc., in uh, Colombia? Because it's not mainly about the Shia community, but uh, I, I believe the very the large Sunni community too. Yes, yes. Most of Muslims in Colombia are Sunni, uh, but exist three places in which exist Shia communities. First, in Maicao, in northern Colombia. Uh, but they are of Lebanese origin, yeah. uh, from southern Lebanon, and the Sunni Muslims of that place are of the Valley of Bika in Lebanon. So uh, they are traditional Muslims, uh, Shia and Sunni. And I think this uh, is pretty similar to what happened in, in, in Lebanon. In Colombia, it's different. In Bogota, I'm sorry, it's different because uh, most. Shia and Sunni Muslim today are were converted to Islam, but because usually Shia convert, uh, converted uh, people first uh, enter as Sunni Muslims, uh, they don't have this uh, rivality. Usually, they try to understand each other. So that's the reason why they share the same places of prey and even some social activities, uh, no matter if they have. Um, practices, uh, different practices according to their, uh, the, the kind of Islam they follow. But in Buenaventura, I think the, all this is more integrated because it was the same community that passes during these different stages. Um, because of that, the f few people that are still in the, is uh, Sunni Muslim, they don't feel a part of the community. Even, they, they, even today exist some old people that consider themselves part of Nation of Islam. But it's still for, for them it's important that the community is just one. To be Shia or to be Sunni is not so important. The thing is that uh, for an institutional organization, Shiism um, is more useful, but not necessarily uh, implies the separation with the other um, Muslim tradition that exists among members of the community. We have time for one more question. Um, thank you. Uh, you talked about the Catholic tradition, but not specifically the liberation theology. So I was wondering if you could trace any overlaps or tensions between the religious and political teachings of Nation of Islam, liberation theology, and the Iranian revolution. Ah, yes, of course. But they tried to deal with that every day, uh, especially because they, uh, what happened with the, with the Iranian influence is that they have been trying for more than 10 years uh, to impose the masculine the, uh, figure of the Shaykh, uh, because traditional women, especially in the, in the origins of the community, were more important than today. But still, they are important in, in, the, in the issues of the community. Because in black communities in Colombia, the, the, the role of women are very important. Uh, but uh, because the Iranian influence, they are trying to impose the figure of the religious leader, the Chai. The Chai who studied in Iran, and in, uh, because of that, he knows what kind of religion vision is better. Uh, but in daily life, the community think that they are uh, they need to consult any decision they take. They, are, they don't support the idea that the Chai, as a leader of the community, can lead the process alone. And because of that, they try to, to negotiate with, with him, but, but the Chai to sometimes hide the initiative. 
to um, try to negotiate what kind of celebration one Muslim can participate, for example. Even sometimes the, uh, some, one person say, well, my, my wife want to, my, my son to be baptized. I don't like that because I'm Muslim. And the Sheikh say, well, that is not really important. What is important is the family. So if you want, you don't need to believe in that. You can uh, participate in the ritual and that is not important. Uh, I think those are the, the, the spaces in which they uh, show that for them, the ethnic aspect of this uh, religion identity is more important than the doctrinal uh, base, I think. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Our second speaker is Medina Tiom from UCLA, and the title of her talk is Absolutely and Utterly Free, Sahelian Kinship, Muslim Schooling, and Emancipation Between Jamaica and Middle Nigeria, around 1790 to 1854. Niger, not Nigeria. Oh, sorry. Uh, so it will be focused on Mali, mostly, actually. OK. Um, so this, this is work in progress that I'm uh, presenting today. It's one of the case studies that I'm focusing on for my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, and the overall dissertation traces global and local histories of uh, travel and mobility from uh, the West African Sahel, and more specifically present-day Mali, um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and to do that, I trace micro-histories of specific travelers, looking at their lives, at their trajectories, uh, at their words. And for each traveler, the central concern that I try to keep uh, is to try to figure out how their mobilities relates to their freedom, the idea of freedom. Um, how do they define that idea? How do they exercise it? Um, and how does it relate to, to their travels? Uh, so today I'm talking about one of these travelers that, I've, uh, that I have been following. Uh, so I'll begin with his story. On September 9th, 1834, in Kingston, Jamaica, a thick crowd filled the public office of Judge Richard Robert Madden. The attendees had gathered to witness landowner Alexander Anderson's manumission of Edward Doolan, a man he lawfully owned. The judge first recounted at length the circumstances that had led to the ceremony. As he did so, emotions were running high in the room. Uh, he quotes, people of all complexions, including white slave owners and enslaved blacks, were smiling and shedding tears of joy. Eventually, Doolan and Madden proceeded to affix their signatures at the bottom of the manumission certificate sealing Anderson's renouncement of his ownership rights. The document declared Doolan, and I quote, absolutely and utterly free to all intents and purposes. The September 1834 ceremony came about as Jamaica was entering a period of intense mutations in its economy and its society. Um, from the mid 18th through the early 19th century, the island had stood as the British Empire's most, most profitable colony due to ex its exports of sugar, coffee, and other crops produced through slavery. Between 1740 and 1807, um, it is estimated that British ships stripped about 2.2 million Africans from the continent, um, and around 600,000 of them um, ended up in Jamaica. By 1788, the vast majority of the island's population was either African-born or of African descent and enslaved. In 1807, uh, the British legislature formally banned the trade in slaves throughout the empire, and in 1833, so a year before the ceremony that we discuss, um, it abolished slavery altogether. As part of this process, the British Crown appointed Richard Robert Madden, uh, an Irish medical doctor, as special magistrate in charge of overseeing the application of the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act in Jamaica. Edward Doolan, the man whose uh, manumission Madden oversaw, was born Abu Bakr Siddiq Ouattara around the year 1790, uh, in the region surrounding the inner delta of the Niger River in the West African Sahel. Uh, so that's the re region I'm referring to as the Middle Niger. Um, he grew up in between the two largest cities of the, of the region, Timbuktu and Jene, which had been uh, cosmopolitan centers of Muslim education and intellectual production, as well as hubs for the trade in salt, gold, and humans uh, for centuries. Watara was therefore Muslim, uh, uh, like the vast majority of the city's inhabitants, uh, and had been made to adopt this Christian name in slavery. Um, and in fact, on the left-hand side of the manumission certificate that was drafted in 1834, 
uh, Madden, the judge, penned the following annotation. Um, Edward Doolan, known before his baptism by the name of Abu Bekir, Certificate of Release of Apprenticeship. By the time he became legally free in 1834, um, Ouattara was around his mid-40s and had spent about three decades living in captivity in Jamaica. Within a few months of the ceremony, he embarked on a ship departing the island with the intention of returning to his homeland. Uh, we know for a fact that he did manage to make it at least to Morocco, um, and what's more, multiple accounts actually claim that he did return to Jene eventually, although these claims are, remain unverified. Um, so there's quite a remarkable amount of information that is known about uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Ouattara's life, uh, particularly regarding two specific periods. The first period is the one of his upbringing and his education uh, in Jene and in Timbuktu and the circumstances that led to, this, to his capture. And then the second period is that of the journey he undertook in the year following his manumission when he was trying to go back um, to Africa. Um, so this actually leaves us with a considerable gap of information about the three decades that he spent and slaved in Jamaica. Um, and the information that we do have about him comes from uh, two sets of sources. Uh, the first one, and that's an important one, uh, is that Ouattara himself authored an autobiographical document in Arabic, of which several English language translations were produced and are currently available. However, and that's an important caveat, none of the Arabic originals that he wrote uh, are, are known to have survived. Um, and so this poses a series of questions and problems about you know, what was lost, what was added, uh, what was misunderstood in the course of this translation, because we only have translations today. Um, in addition to his autobiography, um, more information about Ouattara is included in the, uh, the writings of people he encountered. So these include uh, Judge Madden's memoirs about the time he spent in Jamaica, in which he wrote extensively about Ouattara, um, as well as other African Muslims enslaved on the island. Uh, among these other, Af other West African Muslims enslaved, there was a man by the name of uh, Mohamed Kaba Saranogo from Kong in present-day northern Ivory Coast, um, who we know corresponded with Ouattara on at least one occasion. So we also have that specific correspondence. Uh, same in English. It is a translation that was included in Madden's book. Um, I've decided not to elaborate on, on, on Kaba, this other character, too much during this presentation. Uh, uh, Yacinda Diadun and Paul Lovejoy have written a very interesting paper and chapter on him specifically. Um, so I'll focus on this, this other character, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Ouattara. Um, and so other sources about Ouattara's life that uh, I've been using, an important one is a journal that was written by a British traveler by the name of John Davidson. Um, Davidson journeyed alongside Ouattara from London to Watnoon in southwestern Morocco in 1835 and kept lengthy travel notes. Uh, I think I have, yeah, those are the two main sources that I was discussing. So on the left-hand side, uh, it's Madden's book about his time in Jamaica, and on the other side, it's uh, Davidson's um, journal. Um, and so these sources that we have about Ouattara's life do fit kind of like the usual source base that... Uh, exists around several other West African Muslims that were uh, enslaved in the Americas, uh, such as Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, Nicolas Saeed, Omar Ibn Saeed, um, or Abdurrahman uh, uh, Ibn Sori. So for all of them, um, usually we have a, a narrative that has been written by this specific uh, person, either in Arabic or in, uh, in English, uh, surrounded by other accounts by, from white European or American contemporaries of that person um, who deemed their story, who out of racism de deemed their story more remarkable or interesting than that of other enslaved blacks um, and decided to spread the word. Um, so Watara's narrative and story definitely fits this specific genre. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, what I do find interesting about him uh, with regards to him specifically is the following two points that I'll elaborate upon um, in the remainder of the presentation. Um, so first is that upon being enslaved, um, Ouattara strategically mis made use of his Islamic upbringing and culture, as well as his uh, family and social connections um, back in the Middle Niger, in order to increasingly over time negotiate spaces of autonomy and self-determination within his condition, um, and ultimately try to achieve freedom to the extent that that was possible. Um, and then the second point is that uh, if Ouattara did experience extreme and violent dislocation upon being captured 
as a teenager, enslaved and taken across the Atlantic, um, it is likely that he would have perhaps found himself equally as much as lost, um, at loss, sorry, upon arriving back to the Middle Niger uh, as a middle-aged man in 1835 in an entirely different social and geopolitical setting than the one he had left behind. Um, so let me provide more details about um, these two points, and to do that, let me give more um, details about his story overall. So that's an excerpt from uh, Watara's autobiography, where he, ex he explains, before all these events occurred, my father used to travel widely. He went into the land of Katsina and Borno. There, there he married my mother and then returned to Timbuktu with her. Two years later, he visited his brothers. He had his slaves in tow during his visit to Jene, Kong, and Buna. There, the slaves stayed, served my father, and collected much gold. Um, we see already in this short excerpt that uh, a lot of the cities, that several of the cities that uh, uh, he could claim family ties to or connections to uh, were very important cities in the, the region, both in terms of trade and in terms of intellectual production. Um, so Watara was born around 1790 uh, in Timbuktu. He was raised in Jene for the most part, however. Um, his mother was a Hausa woman from Borno, as we saw, and his father was a wealthy slave-owning Jula merchant uh, who was living between the times of Timbuktu and, and Jene, but originally came from Kong. Uh, his father was also a scholar trained in Tafsir, um, and following his early years growing up in Jene, uh, Watara then traveled to Buna, uh, where his father, who had by then passed, was buried. Um, he stayed there to visit his father's grade, and then he undertook his own schooling. Um, in the autobiography, he describes Buna, uh, and I quote, as a place of dwelling for many learned uh, men who are not natives of one place, but each of them, having quitted their own country, has come here and settled. Um, as Watara was getting ready to leave Buna and embark, embark on a journey to perform the Hajj alongside one of his teachers, a war broke out be between Buna and neighboring Bondonku. Um, actually, let me see, I think I have a map. Yeah, sorry, it's not the best quality. Um, and as Bondonku's troops defeated and invaded Buna, um, Watara was captured, um, taken to Bondonku, Kumasi, and later the small port of Lego near Cape Coast in, uh, uh, in present day Ghana. Uh, and from there, he was taken to Jamaica. This would have been in the year 1805, when he was around 15 years old. Uh, also really at the tail end of the transatlantic slave trade, at least from the British. Um, so he got really unlucky. Um, while in Jamaica, in the three decades that he spent there, we don't know much about it. But uh, from what we do know, as I argued earlier, it seems that he made use of his Islamic culture and West African family networks as strategies for achieving incre incremental autonomy and self-determination uh, and eventually move towards freedom. Um, so how so? Well, first, while enslaved on the island, um, rather than concealing it, he openly and frequently made, known, made use of his Arabic literary, skill, literacy skills, uh, publicly demonstrating them in a variety of circumstances. We know that he kept uh, accounting books in, um, in English Ajami, or Jamaican Patois Ajami. Uh, we know that uh, this allowed him to enjoy relative leverage over uh, uh, at least his last owner, who ended up manumitting him, Alexander Anderson, uh, who declared, and I quote, that Watara was invaluable to him, um, that the accounts of the whole of his vast business was kept by him. Um, and this way, Watara was able to work uh, first as a storeman for Anderson, and then uh, he was named a constable. By managing to build up his reputation in this way, he actually caught the attention of several people who tried to obtain his freedom. Uh, among them, there was a French diplomat and, ar and aristocrat, the Duke of Montebello, who actually, upon meeting Ouattara in Jamaica, uh, tried to apply to the colonial office, the British colonial office, to get him free, unsuccessfully. Um, the second person who tried and who did succeed, as we saw, was the Irish judge, Madden. Um, and Madden actually discovers that Ouattara is literate uh, in Arabic, because the day Watara comes into his office to be sworn in as constable, he signs his name on the paper in Arabic, um, as he apparently has had the habit of doing, um, which triggers a whole conversation. And eventually, Madden makes up his mind. He's de determined to bring him back, to get this man free and bring him back uh, um, at least to London. Um, and eventually, he succeeds. 
um, after a long back and forth between Madden and Anderson, the owner, um, the owner agreed to grant Watara legal freedom in the manumission ceremony that we discussed, which took place in Kingston in September 1834 in Madden's office. Um, I just want to show briefly the actual document, um, which is currently on record at the Jamaica Archives, um, the National Archives of Jamaica in Spanish Town. Let me see if I can make this bigger. So this, this whole page is part of a manumission book that is filled with various, um, several such records um, succeeding each other. And here we see in the middle, I don't know if you, people can see well or not. Um, starting around here, uh, so you read here on the left-hand side, Anderson to Doolan Edward, uh, known before his baptism by the name of Abu Bekir. Um, and the whole text sort of like laying out what is happening. Um, Anderson decided to manumit Watara with, um, um, without receiving any money in return. Um, and at the bottom of the document, the signature is both by Madden and Watara himself. Um, and that's on this last line here that is he, he is declared absolutely and utterly free um, and he's free to go. Um, despite ownership of this legal document uh, claiming the opposite, is it, it is hard to imagine that even after the ceremony, Watara did in fact enjoy absolute and utter freedom. Um, his freedom was still very much tentative, especially in Jamaica, where the formerly enslaved were subjected to a regime of apprenticeship very much akin to slavery. Um, and that is perhaps one of the reasons why he thought, sought to return home. Um, unlike other African Muslims, some other African Muslims who were on the island that we know of who decided to stay. Um, here, Watara's strategy somewhat shifts. Um, instead, I, um, I, I, indeed, I believe that he recognized early on the prestige that Timbuktu carried in the mind of Europeans, uh, especially at that time, where in 1834, um, European geographical and historical imaginaries had long exoticized Timbuktu as a site of mystery and immense, immense knowledge and riches. Um, just 10 years before that, uh, some of the first, or a little less than 10 years before that, some of the first European travelers had managed to reach Timbuktu, Gordon Lane of Scotland, and René Caillé of France. Um, even in Jamaica, actually, on the island, there was at least one estate that was named the Timbuktu estate. Um, so perhaps because he recognized all that attractiveness that Timbuktu exercised in the mind of Europeans, um, Ouattara focused on co-opting part of the city's prestige in order to negotiate and achieve a return home. How did he do so? Well, he inserted himself as much as possible in the social fabric and political power structure of Timbuktu, levering, leveraging kinship, family network, and social connections, some real, other and others alleged. Uh, in concrete term, um, first he decided to try and present himself as a guide, who could, someone who could become a guide for Europeans traveling to Timbuktu. Um, Madden uh, says that at the urgent request of Ouattara, he applies to the Royal Geographical Society to try and get him hired as a guide. The application is unsuccessful. Uh, because the Royal Geographical Society says that, well, this is somebody who has been away for 30 years. There is no way he can actually know the region well enough to you know, guide travelers uh, who are trying to go there. Um, nonetheless, later that year, Watara embarks on a London-bound ship alongside one of Madden's colleagues. Um, first, he stops in London, um, gives a presentation at the Royal Geographical Society, and then in September 1835, uh, both Watara and John Davidson, uh, another English traveler, embarked on a ship headed to Morocco. Um, they stay for several months in the Wad Noon region uh, until they eventually decide to leave. And on December 18th, 1836, shortly after de departing Wad Noon, the expedition is attacked. Davidson is killed. Um, and from this point on, Watara's fate remains uncertain, although according to several local reports that emerged in the 1830s and in the 1840s as well, he did manage to go back to Jinnah. Um, now let's assume that he did, in fact, go back. Uh, this brings me to my second point, which will be brief because uh, I'm still working through it uh, and also I'm running out of time. Um, but I think this is very interesting because Watara's trajectory allows historians to get its insight into the, the social and intellectual worlds of a man who got caught at once in 
the deep changes that affected Jamaica that we discussed at that moment, um, um, the abolition of slavery, the, the Baptist War, which was a large-scale rebellion that took place on the island, um, that we don't know whether or not he participated in it, uh, if he did, the extent to which he did, if the Muslim community did, the nature of this involvement, uh, but those are extremely big changes that are taking place in Jamaica at the moment that he, in his last few years there. Um, at the same time, if and when he does return to Jamaica, um, sorry, to Jene, it was a very different geopolitical situation that he would have encountered there. Um, in 1818, a new polity in the region, the, the Fulani uh, theocratic state known as the Masina Dina, uh, rose from uh, its capital, Hamdalai, to uh, impose a new political and social order in the region. And Ouattara's hometowns of Timbuktu and Jene actually fell under the Dina's domination. Um, so by the time he came back, the geopolitical order would have, he would have encountered was con considerably different from the one he left, uh, therefore uh, putting in jeopardy his argument that his family was so powerful in Timbuktu that he could successfully bring any European traveler there um, and have them be safe. It seems that Watara was perhaps aware of this. Sorry, that's my own alarm. It seems that he was perhaps aware of this uh, uh, and grew increasingly uncomfortable with some of the claims that he had made. Um, for example, in his journal, Davidson writes about the fact that Watara claims that, um, uh, and he, he, I'll just read his quote actually. He says, my companion Abu's family is still on the throne of Timbuktu. Uh, Hamed Libu, so by that he meant Ahmed Lobo, the, the, the first uh, ruler of the Dina, the, present, the present king being one of his cousins. Um, this is very difficult to believe if we know what we, from what we know about Watara's family's background. His family was from Kong, he was from a Jula family. You now have a, 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 a Fulani state in power with no obvious links uh, when we think about what Tara earlier told us about what he told us about his family, so this is the kind of claims that he makes, and there are many of many such claims um, in Davidson's journal about his family role in Timbuktu and in Jene that um, perhaps would have been difficult to sustain had he indeed brought back some travelers. Uh, so we don't know if he survived or not the attack that he killed Davidson, uh, but if he did, um, I would suspect that suspect that perhaps that was relief that he actually didn't have to bring this random English traveler to a place that he himself did not know anymore um, and where he did not, perhaps did not have a lot of the, the ties that he claimed to have. Um, and again, this is still work in progress. I guess I'll conclude. So I, there's still more research that could be done about, uh, first of all, in both in Jene and in Timbuktu, if he did return, it would be hard to believe that there is no trace at all um, um, in any writings or in any of the families that, you know, this person who had been gone for 30 years, came back. Um, so this is something else that uh, that is left to do. Um, and also a lot of bits and pieces here and there. Still, his actual originals of his manuscripts are not found. That would help a lot with regards to what he says about his family, some of the names that he writes. All we have are transcriptions for people who are not necessarily familiar with uh, the kind of Arabic script that he was writing and so on and so forth. So again, a lot of questions still, but it's still a very interesting history and trajectory in between uh, these two uh, locales on both sides of the Atlantic, um, Jamaica and the Middle Nisha. I'll stop here. So questions? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Medina. I, I just want to draw your attention that at the moment, uh, there is a program called Arabic in Slavery being run by Duke University, by Mbailo. And I'm quite uh, fascinated with the kind of thing that is coming on there in terms of the directives of uh, ex-slaves and slaves uh, arguing for their manumission, so to say. So you may want to follow up on that and see whether there's anything related to what are there. Well, I wouldn't know. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I didn't know that. Um, thank you, Medina, for this very fascinating research. Um, I, I guess my question is to kind of push you on your argument a little bit further. Like, um, you seem to be falling back more on uh, sort of an argument of um, 
ethnic and familial connections and, and networks across the Atlantic, which is really fascinating in and of itself. I, I'm just wondering where you locate the kind of the Islamic identities, especially when he gets back and how um, you, you seem to invoke this Islamic identity for him sort of carving out spaces of autonomy while he's enslaved. Um, but I don't know if you have further sources for that, like Umar Said, we have interesting sources about his um, production of talismans and that kind of a thing. And I don't know if you have a similar evidence um, for this Abu Bakr figure, and then you know how does how are you, are you how are you sort of speculating about um, the transposition of his Islamic identities when he comes back into you know the Middle Niger? Yeah. Um, you know, so questions that would be interesting, like is his sort of scholarly reputation intact still? Is he, how it, has his practice of Islam, you know, <laughs> has it slipped or, you know, it, it, these would be interesting questions. Yeah. Uh, no, for sure. Uh, yeah, I guess on that part of your question, I, and here I don't know, I can only speculate because we have so little, such little information about once he comes back. That said, I don't think he was, so he left, when, when he was captured and left, he was very young still, and still undertaking training, so in schooling. Um, so in the sources from uh, Madden and from Davidson, he gets presented as this extraordinary scholar, you know, who, who can write Arabic. Actually, that's the only, only sort of like basis for this claim that he is such a big scholar. So I, I actually suspect that if he did come back, I don't know that this would have been the first... Uh, thing that would have gotten evaluated just because I don't think he reached such a high level of knowledge before leaving. He was still very young. Um, and there are, well, again, we don't know what happened if, if he did reach Jene, but uh, throughout Davidson's uh, uh, travel journal, there are sort of like mentions of his interactions um, with people in Morocco that he encounters. Uh, David, Davidson keeps talking about the fact that uh, He's a highly respected figure. Every time his uh, story is brought up, um, everybody you know, uh, 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 claims that it's extraordinary, that he's really respected. Um, he does, again, make, throughout his, his, his trip, uh, travel, sorry, makes uh, claims about who, this, who his family is. So perhaps that's why he's able to, uh, what he's able to derive some of that respect from. Um, but that goes back to the first part of your question. I guess I'm still trying to figure out or tease out um, the family connections versus the, you know, Islamic learning uh, and scholarship that he was able to attain, what, what, which aspect played what role at what point? Um, and I think that's probably something that, uh, that moved around, right? Uh, something that I did find interesting about the family connection is that at least one of these other uh, um, um, enslaved African that he encounters on the island who's Muslim, uh, his family also is from Kong, and also is from one of these like learned family from the same, similar region. So I wonder, and and the only trace that we have of them having uh, interacted is this one letter that's between them. Again, so it's an English language translation of the er original Arabic letter that we have, and it's a letter that they know is going to pass through the hands of uh, other Europeans. So the letter seems very actually um, disingenuous. They say, oh, uh, you know, they both pretend to have converted in that document. Uh, and they say, you know, like, I heard about your story. Like, um, you know, it's good to know that you're uh, in good hands here. Um, and uh, 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 it's good to know that you have converted. But there are some elements within the letter that, that I guess, give a hint that they knew each other outside of that and that they're just writing in such a coded manner because it's passing through the hands of other people. Um, so again, same. I don't know if their uh, connection came from the religious aspect or the ethnic aspect. And at least, and I mean, I'm still reading through the sources and kind of like trying to tease out and, and establish, you know, what played which role uh, at that moment. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Just with the microphone. Thanks, this was really fascinating. And one thing that I find myself wondering about along similar lines as Zachary really is, in the clearly very strategic self-presentation of this traveler. Do you get any sense that he is, in a way, engaging with Western notions of Orientalism? I mean, he is clearly, he is working to establish status. And interestingly, 
his Islamic identity appears to be useful in this context, not just in the terms that he has inherited, but also in the eyes of um, Europeans in, in a very complicated way. Um, and thinking, being a specialist in East African history, one thing that comes to my mind here is that later in the 19th century, when Europeans move into East Africa, something very odd happens in that abolishing slavery is officially a justification for that, but at the same time, notions about the relatively beneficial nature of what is then called dom domestic or Islamic slavery um, are used to justify the maintenance of relations of slavery on, on parts of the Swahili coast, for instance. So is he even perhaps in, in some ways seeking to redeploy these notions about different forms of, of slavery? It's, it's, it's striking that he is reminiscing about being from a dynasty of slave owners in a world that is moving towards abolitionism. And there have to be slippages there somewhere. Yes. Um, so I do think he appeals from uh, he appeals to European notions of Orientalism, just because he centers Timbuktu too much in his narrative. Um, at the end of the day, he only claims that he was he was he was born there, but he never really lived there. That's not where he was brought up. That's where, not where most of his family ties are. Yet suddenly, you know, in this narrative, he becomes like the the sheriff of Timbuktu, or the son of the sheriff of Timbuktu. So um, yeah, I do think that like the way he centers it a lot, it it, it becomes a bit suspicious. Um, that question about slavery and his own relationship to it is very interesting because I, same though, it was very striking how he talks about um, how his father owned slaves. Um, it's very difficult to know what he thinks about the institution of slavery because outside of this mention of his father owning slaves, he, he never discusses it. And in the narrative, he does not discuss his life in slavery in Jamaica. If it's not to praise uh, his last uh, owner who is giving him his freedom, he doesn't discuss it at all. Um, another place where we do, again, maybe you can start to find traces of what he might have thought about it is in Davidson's journal, once they are uh, in Morocco, there are, again, multiple, multiple mentions of how uncomfortable uh, Abu Bakr gets every time he sees um, especially blacks being enslaved. Like, he, like it, it, it comes up like several times, like at, at least four different times where like, oh, he saw these people, like he, he, it made him visibly, you know, uncomfortable or sick, or he seems like he cannot bear the, the, the um, yeah, the sight of, 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 of this happening. So again, we can only speculate about what that means with regards to um, his own view on the institution, whether or not his view has changed and the extent to which it has. Um, if it's just a personal thing where he is afraid to fall back into this, or if it's a more you know, more on grounds of, of being against the institution. Yeah, that's, those are all things that I, we can only guess, because he, he's, he's actually extremely careful not to talk about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Ayo DG Ogunayake from Bowdoin College. Uh, I'll only read the pre-colonic part of his title. Uh, Bilal Al Brazil. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Halasi. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, so as you can probably guess from the title of my uh, my paper, um, my basic argument is that um, in Brazil, particularly during colonial times, all the way through actually the 20th century, um, Brazil effectively functioned as an extension of Bilada um, Sudan, um, intellectually, culturally, um, and otherwise. Um, so the main thrust of my argument, um, as I just mentioned, is that there was a strong recreation of Islamic communities and intellectual traditions, um, and that the Atlantic functioned really as a, a site or a center of communication and facilitation of the exchange of goods, ideas, and unfortunately people in this way. Um, in much the same way that you know, everyone has established now that the Sahara, unlike the way that Hegel and Europeans thought about it, you know, was clearly a, a method of communicating or connecting people on both sides of those particular coasts. Um, another part of it is that uh, since Paul Gilroy published his you know, groundbreaking work, The Black Atlantic, lots of people have begun applying it to the idea of religion, um, but specifically
Specifically, it's been in reference to traditional African religions. So things like Santeria, Candomblé, that kind of thing. Um, and then also black Christianity, like Pentecostalism. However, nobody's really talked about how Muslims factor into this, which is really surprising given the large number of West African Muslims who were part of the Atlantic slave trade. So when my study focuses on Brazil, and I thought the best place to start would really be to look at the ethnic origins of uh, the people who were involved. And so the first documented Muslims, although there were surely some before then, uh, arrived in Brazil in the 1780s, um, so you know, right around the time of the American Revolution. Um, but in time, just a few decades after that, um, over half of the imported slaves into Brazil were identified as Muslim. They carried Muslim names. They told people that they were Muslims. Most of them had to go through Catholic catechesis. Um, and that obviously, you know, the fact that people were Muslim usually came out um, during events like that. Um, at first, most of them were Hausa and Fulani. If you know your West African history, this is clearly linked um, to the establishment of the Sokoto Caliphate and Usman Danfolio's, uh, Usman Danfolio's uh, revolution. Um, but in time, there were more who came from Borno and Nukbeland, um, which is in the middle belt of what's now Nigeria. Uh, but then in the 1820s, when there were a lot of intertribal wars in Yoruba land, uh, many of them were Yoruba, or as they were referred to in Brazil, Nago. Um, they then began to take um, charge of the Muslim community, um, which was previously headed up mostly by Fulanis, which you know, is quite natural um, given the communities that they all came from. Um, what's very distinctive about this is many of these uh, Muslims who were brought to Brazil were in fact highly educated. Some of them had already completed Hajj um, and were busy teaching and running some of their own schools and things like that. Um, and if you can imagine those who would be involved in Usman Danfodio's movement, that's not too much of a surprise. Um, one in particular uh, about whom we know quite a lot, uh, his name is Mohammed Abdullah, who's Fulani, um, who I believe was from Kano originally. Um, he was interviewed by Francis de Castelnau, who was a, uh, a French naturalist who went to do some research in Brazil and immediately realized that a large percentage of the Africans that he met um, were not only Muslim, but highly literate in Arabic, uh, which of course is closely related to this Orientalist tradition. Um, but he was so fascinated by them that he decided to write several short biographies on many of the people that he met. Um, and Muhammad Abdullah stood out to him because he had completed Hajj, was very well educated, had memorized the Quran as a young boy. Um, but in particular, he kept trying to convert the castle now. And when the castle now tried to pay him for some of his services and things, he called him un chien de chrétien. And he was so incredibly proud of being a Muslim, and everybody respected him. Even the non-Muslim Africans all came to him to ask for advice, services, and that kind of thing. Uh, literacy, obviously, is what stands out in the records that we have, um, because that's what the Europeans cared about, but also because, um, as Professor Khan has actually mentioned in his, uh, his book, Beyond Timbuktu, um, European travelers, whether it was on, or I, on either side of the Atlantic, were always shocked by the fact that Africans were more literate in Arabic than the Europeans were not only in Latin, but oftentimes their own languages. So the Portuguese colonialists, the vast majority of them were semi-literate at best. Um, whereas the literacy rate, especially amongst the Muslims, was usually you know, somewhere around 50% or higher because they continued to study Arabic after they had come. Um, in the 1900s, a third of the Africans, uh, so the people who were born in Africa, all over Brazil were actually Muslim. Um, and Malay or Mina identity was closely linked with Islam and a very proud character and almost an air of superiority over their colonial masters. Malay is the Yoruba word for Muslims, um, which came to be the general broad term for all Muslims in Brazil at the time. And Mina was the kind of catch-all term that the Brazilians used for people who came from ports along the coast of West Africa, all the way from the Bight of Benin through Ghana. Um, it was estimated, I believe this was by Sylvian Juf, that there were thousands of literate Muslims in Rio alone in the 19th century. Um, and again, as I mentioned, Europeans um, recognized that they were oftentimes not only just more literate, but more intelligent than the Portuguese who were there. And so I have this argument that uh, it was an extension of Bilá de Sudan because of the particular nature of Brazilian slavery. So it wasn't simply just because that there were almost 4 million Africans who were brought to Brazil, which makes it a much larger population than you'd find in other places in the Americas. Um, but Brazilian slavery was very particular. In particular, there was a stereotype of Minas or West Africans as better urban slaves. And there was a very large urban population of slavery. So most people who came from West Africa were not sent to plantations because the Portuguese believed that they were uh, better suited to an urban lifestyle and craft work. 
And this is mostly because um, Yorubas or Hausas were used to living in major cosmopolitan urban centers, uh, whereas people from West Central Africa um, tended to live a more agrarian lifestyle. There was also a, uh, a very particular type of social institution uh, called Negros Giganyu, um, which were slaves who uh, were able to operate or work independently of their masters. They didn't even need to live in the same place. They simply had to send their masters a set amount of money every so often, whether it was by the week or the month or something like that. Um, so they effectively controlled their own time and labor. Um, Many of the people who worked in these urban centers were organized into cantos or working groups, um, and they were usually organized along ethnic lines because it was most natural for them to work with people who spoke the same language and had the same social customs. Um, in Bahia, the, the, uh, the center of uh, African culture and Islam, 80% um, of them at a certain point in time were composed of Yoruba people. Um, and if you know about uh, the collective rotating credit structures that were very common all over West Africa, this was a natural place for people to work on collective manumission. So every week or every month, everyone would contribute a certain amount of money. They would pull their resources and give it to one person. And oftentimes, that person would try to use that money to buy his own freedom, because that was a legal right for slaves most of the time in Brazil. And then he would be able to make more money, continue to contribute to that association, and then they would all lift themselves up out of poverty. And Muslims achieved manumission much more um, commonly or frequently than many other groups. So as a result, they had a great, con uh, a great degree of control over um, their work, their time, their labor, and association. Many lived together in these major urban centers. Um, and some of them, especially those who had uh, bought their freedom, owned their own shops that they would use to teach Quran, Arabic literacy. I'm not sure too much how much they, they may have done beyond that, because we don't have records. But we know that they did that for sure. And they would even pray together, because they could close up the shop so nobody could see what they were doing. And we have lots of accounts of that happening in many different places. Um, furthermore, we also know that many people, um, other slaves, other Africans, and even colonial um, Euro-Americans, uh, observed that they would sew Muslim clothes. They would study Arabic. Um, many of them would actually um, sell their religious services while they were waiting for clients, while they were sedan chair carriers or barbers or things like that. Um, and some of them actually were able to buy their freedom simply based on the amulets that they would create or the prayers that they would give people, um, both white and black. And so I began to think of this really as a black Atlantic Muslim community because there are, are records now of correspondence and, and ways that they, they uh, organize themselves with major imams in all of the important cities. And so you can see, oh, I'm not sure, yeah, here we go. Here, there were four major cities here, mostly in the states of Bahia around here, Rio here, and then Pernambuco in the northeast. Um, and they were all established by the main or central imam who was here in Bahia. And Salvador, the, the capital of the, the state of Bahia, was really the seat of authority. He would set the calendar um, and then give authority to people to, um, sometimes they would even appoint cadiz and that kind of thing. There was a great dispersal from Salvador after the, the massive revolt in 1835 that some of you may have heard of, um, where mostly Muslims, um, Yorubas and Hausas, but they drew in some others as well, almost took over the colonial capital. Um, and they used religion as the way to, to organize themselves. Um, as there, after that, there was a huge wave of Islamophobia, and the Brazilians actually deported some of them back to West Africa and then tried to sell them to other parts of Brazil to stop there from being any more insurrections. Um, they were fortunately unsuccessful in that endeavor. But many of the um, Africans who left Bahia, um, either because they were deported or won their freedom and then traveled back to West Africa on their own, uh, were the founders of many of the communities, uh, the Muslim communities in West Africa now along the coast you can see here. So major urban centers like Lagos, Porto Novo, um, Badagri, um, or Ag uh, Wida, um, all had their, their uh, first religious leaders were actually Afro-Brazilians who initially got their education in West Africa. One of the most interesting sources that I was able to find was um, al-Baghdadi. He was an Ottoman. Um, he wrote uh, Masaliyat al-Gharib, who um, he was, I believe he was traveling to Iraq, but got blown off course and ended up in Rio in 1865 and was surprised that as soon as he got off the boat, uh, a black man in Western clothes um, walked up to him and said, Salaamu Alaikum, 
And he thought it was really strange um, and then kept going on his way and then it kept happening to him. And he got invited later on to meet the community and he saw you know, hundreds of people collected in a house um, and he was so amazed by what was going on, he actually asked permission to stay. And he stayed there for three years and taught people in Rio, Salvador, and uh, Recife. Um, uh, he had a fairly low opinion of everyone's piety and education, um, which isn't too surprising when you compare it to other Arab accounts of the practice of Islam in, uh, in Africa. Um, the main thing he kept going back to was that he disapproved of the practice of geomancy. Uh, he said, these guys are too obsessed with this kind of thing. He didn't describe what it was, but it was almost definitely Khatarama, which was very popular um, in particularly those areas, what's now Nigeria. Um, he also may have started the very profitable trade in Qur'ans in Rio. He found a Qur'an in a book, French bookstore, um, and then he asked if he could buy it and then told them they should get more, because as soon as he brought the Qur'an to the community, everyone was so incredibly happy um, about it. And so to get to the scholarly activity, which is what I really find the most interesting, um, I chose to focus on this because in all of the other work that's been done on the fairly large and prominent um, Muslim population in Brazil, um, everyone has looked at it from the perspective of resistance and rebellion. Um, so maybe there's some attention paid to amulets, um, but then previously people would actually think a lot of the things that they wrote was like political insurrection or trying to organize um, a battle plan or something like that. Someone, a, a French Jesuit priest, actually interpreted a magic square as a battle plan. Um, and it had absolutely nothing to do with it, but they think that Muslims are just here to overthrow the government effectively, um, which, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, I suppose. Um, so as you can see, common talismanic um, uh, formulas, Ayat al-Kursi, al-Mu'awadatayn, um, all of those were found. But in fact, when they found religious papers, when raids were made on many of these Muslim houses, um, sometimes they'll say we found an infinity of papers, and they couldn't interpret many of them um, because they were simply looking for the wrong thing, I think. Um, later on, scholars have actually found that there, were, there are copies of other texts which were common in West Africa. People were writing out prayers, um, and then there were instruction manuals and things like that for students. Um, some of these schools were actually established in the open as well. There are accounts here and there of slaves, oftentimes of other people, like there was an English merchant who allowed his slaves to effectively establish or build a masjid. They celebrated Eid openly. They would invite other slaves to come in and learn um, Arabic literacy and then higher sciences as well. Um, there are a lot of arguments about the multiple levels of learning, but again, I think some of this may actually be misunderstanding because um, when some of these documents were sent abroad to be analyzed, they'll say, oh, they keep mistaking one letter for another, which is you know, a very common trope in that when you're the master and you don't want this information to be widely accessible to everyone, you use obfuscation. Um, and so I think there's this assumption that they couldn't have been very literate. Um, and so I think this is a mistake that's often made. Um, the Ajami tradition was also maintained, and this is an area that I think would be great for research, um, thank you. because usually people who analyze them have no familiarity with African languages, and so they have no idea what's going on. And I have a strong suspicion that um, the, the tradition of praise poetry was probably maintained there as well, particularly in the Ajami. Um, and we know that scholarly activity was so important because uh, it keeps coming up every time you hear uh, accounts of the community. So Muhammad Abdullah, um, when de Castelna was writing about him, he said, Il revient sans cesse à la foi de Mahomet, qui suivant lui est la seule chose de ce monde qui vaille la peine qu'on s'en occupe. And so it's the only thing that's worth spending your time on in life. Um, and a non-Muslim Yoruba complained that all of these Muslims want to be priests. As soon as they have time, they're all trying to become priests. Um, with respect to the material culture, um, we can tell that this was a major occupation for them because of the incredible amounts of expensive paper. Some of it may have been locally produced, but a great deal of it was actually imported. And so you can imagine when you don't have a lot of money, investing it in paper is a, is a really serious endeavor. There was a lot of local black ink and writing boards which were prepared in exactly the same way they are in West Africa, you know, burning wood uh, and that kind of thing. But important blue and red ink were actually imported from West Africa. So when you're writing formulas and you need to put the person's name in red ink inside, all of that was taken directly from West Africa. So they had the means and the money to be able to do that. They also used the Maghrebi or Sudani scripts, um, which is very familiar. We have some written correspondence of people communicating mostly within Brazil, but I believe it happened with West Africa as well. Some locally um, produced books and manuscripts, but some also imported from West Africa as well. Tasbih, uh, and as I mentioned, this French bookstore, Fauchon Dupont, 
They sold 100 copies of the Quran every year. Um, that was reported in 1869. And they said some slaves would go into debt for a whole year to be able to buy one of these Qurans. So you can imagine being in debt for a year when you don't even have your own freedom yet. Um, this was something that was quite common for them. Um, so all of this to me points to a very lively um, trade in Islamic goods, which was kept under the radar by and large because the British authority or the, the Brazilian authorities, sorry, were so suspicious of Islamic identity. And briefly, I'll just go over this quickly. There's a, a series of news articles produced in Rio de Janeiro just after the turn of the century in which he described the, uh, the ceremonies for confirming a new scholar within the community. And again, Rio wasn't the seat of Islamic learning um, and authority. Um, but uh, Sylvian Juf has compared his uh, descriptions to those of Edward Blyden in uh, Sierra Leone at about the same time. And it's incredible how similar they are. Um, they're getting asked a lot of the same questions. After it's all done, they get put on horses and paraded around in the streets, which is a, a very brazen act um, in Brazil at that point in time, but the Muslims weren't terribly afraid of that. Um, there are examples, again, that I've mentioned of uh, al suyutis Kitab al-Rahma and the Borda have all been found. Um, some of the accounts have also mentioned um, the, the community preferring a commentary by Bunu Salami, which uh, doesn't make any sense to me, but I believe it could perhaps actually be a Tijani text, since so many of them might have been um, Tijani. Um, and we know that this type of thing has been happening because, um, as they have up here, Ibn Abi Zaid's Risala was produced uh, not in Brazil, but in Georgia. But given the greater amount of time that um, scholars had in Brazil to continue their education, to be supported by the community, to copy out the Quran and that type of thing, um, I really think a, a lot of the main aspects of the core curriculum in West Africa were recreated and had been memorized by many of the leaders. Um, so many of these people returned to West Africa. One man, Paulo José Ferreira, um, was brought back to Lagos to receive further uh, Islamic education by his parents, um, and then eventually came back to Brazil, um, supported himself on the practice of Islam, and then maintained correspondence and sent money to his family in big centers like Lagos and Kano. The most significant one that I was able to find was this man, Alufa, which is the Yoruba word for a cleric. Uh, he was called Rufino in Brazil, or Abunkare back in Yoruba land. He was born as a prince in Oyo. He, his father was an Alufa, and he gained uh, at least a certain degree of religious instruction before being taken to Bahia in 1823. Um, to cut a long story short, he was captured um, on a, uh, a Portuguese slaving ship um, but was taken to Sierra Leone by the British, and he thought while he was there, uh, not at Fura Bay College, but at the city of Fura Bay itself, he studied under Fulani Shuyuk, um, and then he went back to Brazil, but decided to return in 1845 to further his studies for uh, 19 months. Then he went back to Brazil, ultimately settled down in Recife, where he supported himself entirely um, on um, providing his Islamic services and teaching. And we only know anything about him because the authorities were so afraid of him, given his large following, that they thought he was trying to overthrow the government. So they raided his house, and there's a very long account of his life that he had to give in court. Um, and so I bring him up, not because he's such an exceptional case. I think there were probably many more people like him and some who may have been even more learned. We just happened to know about him um, because he got arrested. No. And when they raided his house, they found uh, you know, a copy of the Quran that he had brought from Sierra Leone, the wooden boards, ink, um, everything else that you would expect to find in a West African sheikh's house. Um, and this is still a bit the case today, even though the Muslim community in Brazil had largely died out. Um, only a decade or two after that fact, um, the, what I call the contemporary Muslim Black Atlantic um, kind of got reinvigorated. So this man here is Sheikh Abdul Hamid Abu Bakr. He's originally from Nigeria. He went to um, the Islamic University of Medina to study. Um, and then he was approached when he came back to Nigeria by the WAMI rep uh, in Lagos to come work in Brazil and lead up this uh, a mosque and Islamic cultural center. And they specifically wanted a Yoruba imam um, because they wanted somebody who could tap into the legacy of black Muslims, African Muslims in Brazil. And more importantly, somebody who also was very familiar working in a religiously pluralistic um, landscape. So because he has an intimate knowledge of traditional Yoruba religion um, and Christianity, he was an ideal person. And he's told me several times when they bring in friends from the Middle East, they usually freak out because they have a lot of their meetings in you know, buildings with crucifixes because the Catholic institutions dominate the environment. And it doesn't work out too well for them. 
Um, so he says really his identity is one of the main factors um, that has drawn so many people to convert to Islam, mostly amongst black Muslims, um, or mostly amongst black Brazilians. Um, and this isn't only the case in Salvador where he runs this center. Um, there have been also been lots of Africans who have been trained within Africa and abroad um, who have led communities in Rio and Sao Paulo. And again, their racial, ethnic, um, and historical identities and connections to um, African Muslim communities are really what allow them to do this. Um, so I view it as historical and continued. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the last president, I'm quite uh, intrigued by these revelations. Well, do you know whether there are some collections of manuscripts, uh, either centrally or privately, by Brazilian Muslims? Uh, that is the first question. The second one is that I've come across some multi, uh, multilingual manuscripts uh, from that part of the world. Mm. Some will be Yoruba, Hausa, whatever. And I wouldn't know whether that indicates any form of collaboration or, I, I mean, it, it's difficult to explain why you could have a manuscript in three or four languages. And uh, I, I can almost tell you the family house of the man you show from Oyo because I'm very familiar with those marks. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Yes, to, with respect to the, um, the question about different languages, um, so these men like Paulo Jose Ferreira and Rufino, both of them were perfectly literate and fluent in Arabic, Portuguese, and Yoruba. Um, so my guess is it wouldn't be too much of a surprise if uh, it was actually written by one person. Um, however, I do know that uh, also letters could be written by you know, somebody who was literate in Arabic and then they could have had somebody else you know, asking them to write things down. Um, so it could be collaboration, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's just one person who is able to speak all of those languages at the same time. Um, as far as collections go, uh, I know the Federal University in Bahia has uh, a fairly large collection of manuscripts there. Um, and then I've heard from the, uh, the leader of the Islamic Center and Mosque in Salvador that some of the descendants of uh, the Malays um, still have some manuscripts in their own possession. Um, so I think there are some individual collectors or individual families that have collections, um, and then the university. Um, unfortunately, most of it has been destroyed because when the Portuguese raided them, they would usually try to get rid of everything. Um, so there isn't too much left, um, but I know that those are some places. Thanks, Deej. That was really, really great. Um, could you talk a bit more about the uh, the influence that the Afro-Brazilian Muslim community had when they returned to West Africa? Because I know I'm familiar with the architectural influence when they came back in Lagos and like Shitabe Mosque and these kind of places. But could you say more about the influence that this group of returnees had yeah. uh, in the Muslim communities and populations in West Africa? Yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned, they were usually the first leaders, at least along the coast, um, because most of the Muslim populations in that area were a bit further north. Um, so they were the ones who really brought and established the practice of Islam there. And then there were many more traders who came from the north and then settled with them afterward. Um, another important aspect of it was because they were so connected with um, trade all along the coast of West Africa. Um, they brought in quite a lot of money. Architecture was naturally something that followed because they were very, very wealthy. Um, I think another interesting um, part of it is also Western education, because many of them um, had become fluent in at least one, if not two, uh, European languages. They were also some of the first to um, provide their children with Western education as well, so Western and Islamic education. Um, and at least in the case of Nigeria, some of these um, returnees or the descendants of returnees were the first ones to push the British colonial government to provide some of those kind of hybrid schools that combined Western education with Islamic education. Um, and so I think they were ones who sort of straddled this world of modernity, um, kind of European modernity um, and traditional Islamic practices. Okay, we have time for one more question. Just... 
If, uh, we've already had questions about uh, the one, the first paper, so maybe you can speak. If your question is about Columbia, maybe in the break, so we give Dej uh, a chance to have okay. a address to him. All right. Um, if if anybody can make any comments about women, women's um, enslaved women's contribution, enslaved Muslim women's, I would appreciate that. So yeah, I can speak to it at least to a certain extent. Um, it seemed there is much less information there, I think largely because of the demographics of the slave trade. So the practice of Islam, at least in Brazil, I don't know as much about other areas, uh, was mostly in the hands of men because very few women were brought over um, because the plantation owners and then also the slave owners in the cities uh, mostly wanted men to practice or to you know, do manual labor for them. Um, so I can't remember what the exact percentages were, but I want to say it was something like four or five to one, um, males to females. Um, and because most of the Muslims were actually, um, had come directly from Africa, um, their descendants didn't always practice Islam. Um, so the participation of women in this tradition was a bit more limited. Um, however, I have read some things uh, about the descendants who did continue to practice Islam. Um, and when it's um, travelers like al-Baghdadi, they say, like, oh, it's so awful that they're not wearing hijab. I was like, well, what are they supposed to do? <laughs> like, they, can't, they can't walk around wearing hijab. Um, but there isn't too much out there, unfortunately. So we're out of time for the first session, so please join me in thanking our panelists for a really fantastic panel. <laughs>